so uh, the next talk is by Keshe. So he'll be talking about uh, Fermi bubbles again. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me, Tasha? So I'm asked to give the second review talk about the Fermi bubble, complementary to our own talk, in order to avoid any duplicity between our talks, and we did our best to do that. Uh, so as Ron already pointed out, the Fermi bubble, uh, there are the various questions pertaining to the bubbles about the uh, engine, the energy source, the source of the cosmic rays, the radiation fields, and uh, what are the edges that we're seeing, and what is, are other features such as group one related. And so these questions are not independent of each other, but nevertheless we have a high dimensional phase space model to so, I think we have the sufficient tools now, and in some cases sufficient data, to rule out large chunks of this space space. That's a shame people would agree with that, but we cross out different chunks of space space. So, um, but at least we can have the tools to do that in the coming years. And, and we've been discussing these models for eight years, and even more. And so I think it's about time we go to we narrow this, uh, these options down. Um, as I'm pointing out here, the edges will be key in this talk. So the edges we see in the map in general astronomy, when we see sharp edges, that are going to be on and off to go some time to So um, after discussing the discovery of the bubbles to complement what Roland said, uh, I'll focus on the edges, then I'll discuss some counterparts, that was some of which were mentioned. Um, then I'll talk about the gamma ray spectrum, which is very telling. Okay. And talk about variations in the spectrum, and the position in the bubbles, and then only then I'll reach out what I think we know and don't know about the underlying process. So the edges, um, these are a of map projections in various bands. Um, this is, so this uh, X-ray map uh, from Lausanne shows what appears to be two giant lobes. Uh, this color, this was enough for software that in 2000 proposed this about now we know that this upper low, well, even back then we knew that this is called the, this is the loop one feature seen in radio uh, for many decades. And I'm not sure the southern feature is real, but nevertheless it looks nice. Uh, loop one may or may not be related to the bubbles, I'll get back to it. Uh, and uh, this is supposed to show a movie, I think it's stuck. Maybe it's been a few times and stuff. Um, but the point is that this is the raw data from Fermi. These maps that you see have been heavily manipulated in order to bring out the bubbles very in a similar way to the, uh, the uh, way in which the microwave haze, which was known back then as a W map haze, was brought out from the raw data. Uh, this is by a ten phase subtraction method, which is a risky procedure. I want to say a few words about that. So, the idea is to take uh, several frequencies, several, several bands, in this case, uh, the x axis and several frequencies of the W map, have different templates to model uh, the CMB, the dust, or whatever one you use for your specific map, in this case, the alpha and dust, etc., and then have a linear regression in which you subtract the components. Uh, this works well, but these tracers are not accurate, and it's not a real, the actual signal is not necessarily a linear superposition of the templates, and that's a risk of over-subtracting or not subtracting enough. Uh, but this was done very carefully by Klingbeiner, and who left this uh, show of my the case. Um, this is a risky business. There are well-known examples where incorrect results were published based on this on subsequent analysis. I think this was done well. In the Fermi case, uh, in the Fermi bubble case, you have to subtract again an English constant component, which is not well constrained, and one component from either a synthetic model or just from taking a radio map. Um, and this is a different, you can study different results, and you're also using observable, observed tracers, observed maps. So the end product is very nice, but I'm, I confess at the time I was very skeptical, many of us were, if this is a real effect. What convinced uh, us eventually were the sharp edges that you see. And so uh, these edges are particularly uh, evident if you look at high energies in the right here, uh, which is uh, 10 to 
about them to go in the see them less pronounced. And you see them mainly in the southern hemisphere. So in general, I will focus on the southern and galactic hemisphere. The northern one is much more messy. There's one other feature is about dust. And so in gamma rays, the southern hemisphere is better. And you can sort of, so on the right, you see the process maps, and you can maybe see uh, the nodes in the process map. But even if you look at the unprocessed maps on the left, the raw data, the, uh, the southern bubble is fairly at it from the raw data. So there are edges, and that's very useful. Uh, it's very hard to manufacture, so templates will not generate all of these edges. Um, so how do we trace these edges? This was done in fact by in the discovery paper by Silwen collaborators by Dustin look, looking at the rock centers of these bubbles and looking at tracing rays, seeing where the density drops, and then uh, manually tracing the, the edge. And what you see here as you go from cyan to yellow is to gradually removing more and more templates. So you really can see that this process is not Perfect. It's very noisy. There are a lot of, are a lot of systematic errors introduced. I'm not worried now about the existence of the bubbles, but the spectrum again has a substantial systematic uncertainty. So um, this is one way. The data is so good now that with Bass A, the recent uh, data analysis, we can Fermi data, we can just apply a gradient filter, and you immediately pick up these edges. These edges. If you decide, if you decide what's the scale of the filter, so of course if you take filter gradient filters of narrow, of narrower scale, you will pick up more and more structure and also more and more artifacts. Um, but these edges are so uh, pronounced, you do see that there are additional features here. You can pick out those fairly easily. The transition we think is about five degrees, so something between four and six degrees is what you want to use, and this is what I will. And the other edges you see here were traced by eye, and they're not very close to the actual edges. Okay. So edges are very useful. This is the whereas theory slide. And because it, if you, as you all know, and if you, the fluxes of mass, energy, and momentum across an edge have to be equal. So just by imposing, stating that the left to right fluxes of mass, for example, are equal, or the difference is zero, you end up with having only a few options. So we immediately know that this has to be either a contact discontinuity or a shock. In this case, of the bubble, we don't expect much shear, so we can pretty much scratch off the potential discontinuity option. Um, and if you add in each of the effects, this doesn't really change uh, the situation much. Uh, you're not likely to encounter these rotational discontinuities in astronomy, not often. Um, so if there are these edges, the question is, of course, which of these options is, is relevant to the Fermi model edges? Are we seeing a connection of the unity or a shock? And if it's a shock, it's a forward shock. Last wave propagating supersonically outwards, or are we seeing a termination shock or a blue shock due to some wind? Um, so you see the many papers uh, were published, and Sue and Tatekal were clever enough to sketch out many of these options right in the discovery paper. And so what are the edges? What is the emission mechanism that Tony and Veronica will discuss nicely? What is the engine? And what is the cross ray injection? Are we seeing cross ray injection ejected at the center of the galaxy properly outward? Or is this the first order for the acceleration as we know very well and see often in supernovae? Or is it the second order for the acceleration, uh, which we almost never so we, have, we have good examples of these strains in that uh, in general. Uh, one question which we kept being asked uh, in the early years of the Fermi model is are we seeing a galactic scale effect or is it, some, is it just some nearby structure seen in projection? And I think we can now argue that this is definitely a galactic center effect. There are several arguments. Uh, one of them is that just that we can now trace the edges of the bubbles all the way to a degree or so from the galactic center. So the logical excellent draw spot arguments. So I, I will not discuss this anymore. And there are other features such as loop one uh, and also the polarized emission that Roland was discussing. So, are they related to the bubbles? Are not discussing. So, this is probably the space space I want to tackle. Um, so, the counterparts of the Fermi bubbles are important. Let's start with them. The galactic haze was already discussed, so, we do double map haze. 
is seen now also by Planck, the power of the spectrum, as one of pointed out, is very hard. And this kind of power law is very easy to, it is naturally interpreted. If you just have a strong shock to uh, accelerate electrons, the electrons will have a power law spectrum of two, and you'll get this kind of new in the spectrum. Um, so the morphological coincidence, I think, I think is very strong. I'm not sure what you agree, but this is trying to show this. It's a, this is a more a quantitative example of this. So on the left you see the Fermi map, and on the right you see the W map case. And the, ed the edges are pretty much aligned. I think you see in the yellow profile you see the gamma rays and the other colors are microwave. So I think the edge matches very nicely. And we're seeing the same feature, I think, in the haze and in the first bubble. Um, made, but it's true that the haze has more structure. So if you look at, so this is again the southern bubble, if I'm looking closer to the galactic center, there's another edge here that from the galactic to 30 degrees, you can see it here. So on the right, so this was a spherical edge. This was just a latitude dependent or a horizontal edge. So I shouldn't really bring these figures together, but I will. So what you see is roughly a double edge structure. And then you see this very clearly in the haze. I think you also see this in the gamma rays. So gamma rays on top, haze on the bottom. And these are the bubbles. So this feature here will be the Fermi bubbles. And these dark lobes are the second edge that we're seeing. They're very pronounced in the haze. I think they're also seen in the gamma rays. Pink binary and soon think that these are jets and uh, come back to this. Maybe this is just two jets seen, but there is some structure there. Um, so if, if we do see a coincidence haze and gamma ray edge, then this would very likely get a pretty bubble feature. Uh, but if you're not buying this, or you think this is an unrelated feature, or you're just not impressed by this, then like, fine, we don't discuss this anymore. If they are related, then we might be seeing what a Structure like Rose was pointing out, something like a forward shock on the outside followed by a contact with continuity. That's one option. Or we could be seeing a reverse shock inside the contact with continuity. Uh, these are two options. I, uh, the contact with continuity interpretation, the second interpretation here, in which the principal edges are contact with continuity, is a bit challenging in my view. I know people in our system disagree because you need to confine the gamma rays below a contact with continuity. Process rays tend to not obey upon the discontinuity, but just diffuse upward. So they need to come up with a way to magnetize them and store them and it's a bit difficult. I think this is more natural, but I'm not gonna claim that this is entirely without it. Yeah. Yet it is possible. Okay, so this is again the software uh, claim that there's a this large uh, bipolar flow from the galactic center based on this map. And then Ron already did a good job in showing this. Zoom in until you can see very nicely the slide for the flow. And what I want to point out is that this in this without image, if you look at it, it's clear that the density, the emission measure inside the bubble is larger than the emission measure outside. So the density is higher inside. This is clearly true at no less. Uh, this will be inconsistent with the reverse shock in the forward shock, in which the gas is compressed by the shock, but not by the first and so this is consistent with having an X-ray shell. So it was argued by many people that we don't see an X-ray shell in the whole bubble. I don't think this applies, ever applied for the low latitude, which is, is it true for the high latitude? We see a shell also there. Um, so let's see. So going a bit higher in latitude, we have this XNM dike, still unpublished, unfortunately. Uh, in which you see that, as far as I know, in which you see that the density, again, the emission measure density, are larger inside the bubble than they are outside. So this is again forward shot, uh, and with the existence of an X-ray shell, so we're up to latitude those by the feet or so. Uh, let's go higher. So at very high latitude, and there is this claim by Sudako that we don't see any shell. In fact, we see the opposite. I don't think this is correct. So in the northern bubble, you see these these. Uh, Pointing is going from outside the bubble, inside the bubble, up to the top. And as you see, the emission measure, when you cross the Fermi bubble head, it sort of wobbles. And um, the problem with this is one that you have a lot of contamination in the northern hemisphere in general. And here you see clearly the region which is affected by these worms. So 
be careful. If you actually trust, I don't know if you can see there's a dash line here showing the actual best position for the model. I wouldn't trust the position to a two degrees plus or minus, but if you believe that, then actually the density may jump here. It's not clear what's going on in the north. It's messy. I would look at the south, and in the southern hemisphere, so you do the same experiment again going inward and you see the jumps, but it's only a marginal potential. So I would, I would claim that this does not indicate either the existence or absence of an expression of any, any that would say that there might be a shell margin in the south. So uh, we went and um, tried to do better than this. It's very difficult in point is to say something because the density is so low, but what you can do is you can stack data along the bubble edges and then uh, boost your signal. Uh, so this is what you're seeing here. This is with that in various stands different colors, uh, the focus on the, the negative side value, side is angular distance from the edge, so this is the inside part of the uh, bubble, then indeed the density of the emission measure goes up, which is consistent with the next ray shell, and then we show that actually match the profile, also match what you would expect from the from explosion. Yes, so this is the edge which we pick up uh, from uh, Gradient filter, but you can also use the manually traced edges. You get a similar result. This is not very sensitive to where it's placed because the, the, the edges are pretty thin. It's quite distinct. But you have to have some edge to use the signal. The pointing is just too noisy. So um, um, you, the fact that so you see here that the three bands are four, five, six, more or less match. That's because we assume the temperature of zero point four degrees uh, in the inter in the Analyzing the data, so this will tell you that the gas inside the edge, inside the Fermi model, is a bit hotter than a factor of two or so with respect to the gas outside, which is thought to be 0.15 or 0.2 kV. Uh, R7 is all over the place, uh, and R7 is a 1 kV gas, so this tells you that the gas is not above a 1 kV. Uh, I should have mentioned maybe when I'm showing the XMM data uh, here that you don't see anything when you go to 1 kV. So we already knew that the gas is not that hot, but you do see it around 1 kV. It's not much about it. And it's all thermal? It's all? Thermal? Um, so you have to subtract some components, so that is messy. You have to the charge exchange, and various other contaminants. Uh, but after you, so this, set, this observation is sensitive only to the, uh, this is a, what we do here is we uh, look at the profile and we subtract Drugs at the very edge. So, if there is a general, uh, so there are non thermal components, so they'll subtract it. And what we're left, what we're left with is something to do with thermal. Can you just look at the data whether it was the therapy for any kind or any kind? I'm not sure. Um, so, this just shows that we're seeing this kind of thing. This is just showing that when we take different control regions, different latitudes, we don't see this effect. It's only happening when we're looking at the actual edges. So maybe this answer, answers your question, Ron. You, the edges, you need to find the right edges to see this. And if you actually look deeper into different sectors, and we're expecting to find the best signal in the, in the south and east, and which where we find the edges very, very clearly, and the other signal is very nice. We also find it in the northwest, which we didn't expect to find it because it's so nice. It's far from the one, but it's still the more messy. In the North region, we're not tracing the edges so well at the south uh, west, and here we have group one, so the results are all much less and, and I won't even discuss the low latitudes, which are also problematic. So we have to go to high latitudes, absolute value P, in order to get away from the galactic disk and, and have the clean observation. And this is a di different. In measurements based on the oxygen seven and eight lines by Miller and Bergman, which that show that the temperature, that the ratio of these lines is consistent with temperature being hotter, again by a factor of two inside the bubble. And how they get the same 0 0.4 kV that we did, uh, and they can also say something about the temperature outside. So it seems that the density and temperature are both boosted by a factor of two as you go inside the bubble. This will be consistent only with the forward shock, which will not be consistent with neither with the reverse shock nor the conductivity. This is where the conductivity continuity arrives in density, 
pushes it all the way up to eight and a half kilobytes or only three or four kilobytes. So I think our table is kind of crazy. Right now. I would argue that 2.5 kilobytes is as good as 8 kilobytes because you are inside the uh, second of the out, out of the disk. So. And the implications for the three volumes are very different. So this is another counterpart which is not, not yet existing. We were hoping to see it. So um, you already have this is because of 1512 for neutrino the IQ and Steam and published in the first day. The release, there are now many more events uh, and so the circles you see here are neutrino events uh, these are showers the smaller ones that you see scattered around are traps so these will be newer neutrinos and the very big circles which are less well localized are either electron or tau neutrinos and you see most of them from the southern hemisphere the reason is just because the earth is no longer uh, is not transparent in these neutrinos because they're very energetic they're between a hundred to uh, even about a thousand to you know, so we don't see so well between the two so we reach my problem. You know? uh, so this is the detection area is low in this field. And uh, we were hoping both us, our group and also Fangit Al they published almost at the same time we needed uh, that uh, we, were, we were hoping to see a correlation we were testing a correlation between these neutrinos a localization and the Fermi bubble, and we couldn't see any. There is no correlation here, nothing significant, so we cannot claim to detection of any neutrino components here. And, however, if you plug in the numbers, the upper limit you get on the neutrino flux is such that the acceleration of the fractional ions that are accelerated by the Fermi bubble, if you interpret them as a shock, is already is, is close to 10%, and it will not be. Much above that. So, um, for standard parameters, we think that we're not far from seeing this problem. This would imply that if we have patients who wait a few years and have the, the order of magnitude of sort of more neutrinos, we have a good chance of picking up this problem, which would be, be a, very, and a very nice uh, measurement of the, the ions find the problem. Okay, so not yet, for the sake of uh, I won't discuss counterparts in other galaxies because the author didn't mention them. Uh, so let's switch to the gamma ray spectrum. Uh, so, what is the gamma ray spectrum? And also, when you're saying with the Fermi bubble spectrum, what, are, what region of the bubbles are we talking about? So, roughly speaking, the bubbles are homogeneous. Spectrum is not dramatically changed from, one, from side to side. So, we can simply use this template and uh, define some edges. I don't know would have a template and pick out this spectrum, which Roy has already shown, and you get this nice uh, spectrum, something like a broken power law. So you get this line for the collaboration fit. Um, and then, if you have a spectrum, you can go to the next state that you can do now another template called the model template, subtract that, and you're left with some residuals, residuals which when things by the claim are showing this jet structure. And then you can measure their spectrum, you can subtract that, find other structure, and go on forever. The errors accumulate quickly, the systematics are huge. I think so. This shaded region is the systematic supported by the printing team. I think they might be even a bit larger. But I'm the, I was the first in the past my template bugs, so I'm, I'm more careful than others. So uh, this is the second that we see. It's about the uh, two and three meter, which was the right, I think. The published other paper measures that uh, say that this case structure is not that significant. I know that the Fermi collaboration published the paper which ah. is saying that this structure, when they cannot confirm it. Ah, okay. So I don't, and I don't know that there's okay. an answer okay. on the environment. But I think that if this is reproduced by many analyses, this is not. But I think that there is some structure here, and we see it as the edges that I mentioned earlier in both the A and the B. But this to be done again by another group more carefully. Uh, I'm not sure that this jet lag is uh, And there's also form and more of structure, which I don't think is worth discussing now until we another group of uh, So this is just if you take through this the broken power law, then you have this P equals 0 0.5, which is the same circle we saw from the days, which might be telling you something. And then it's slightly to P of 1 and uh, dropping very quickly as you increase the energy. Uh, 
and then I just caution again that the systematics are large. There are other ways to through the second of the entire bubble that are without templates. So this V3PO is, is deconvolution and deconstruction with different components, a diffuse component, and a sonar statistics component. Uh, and this very nicely shows that the, 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 in green the, the, the component, the diffuse component that the algorithm will, will spew out. So you don't have to do it, too much work and you get this reconstruction. It's very nice to, in order to show that there is another component there. But I think that it does, does not do a good job in terms of different spectrum. So this is, for example, the red is the bubble like spectrum they see with no low energy turnaround. I don't think we should be using this for spectral analysis and play on vegetable things. But nevertheless, our uh, own efforts. That's right. That's right. It takes up the, and I think it's it really, we can even, it's hard to close it here, but I think in other than you can see that it's closed. I, I think the, in the maps I showed earlier, the Venus the axis, I see it directly from the data, the full rate in the gamma rate. So I don't think this is an artifact, I think this is. So I think this is already quite convincing, but I think we should nevertheless do the the thousand part today. So, okay, so um, now let's talk about the interpretation. So we are already said most of what I wanted, so I don't need to. Um, and if you have a model for the radiation field, you can just upscatter an electronic model, find the electron, the electricity electrons, and see what you get. And you get this beautiful fit by the Fermi team, so we'll have a similar uh, analysis. The problem is that it does not at all work if you don't put by hand the number limit on the electron. You have to impose the number limit at the one around one PV on the electron spectrum. This is not a natural scale, as was mentioned, for the copper cutoff. So who will do that? If you don't do that, then you won't get this cutoff. So um, there are systems in which we see space cutoffs. You know, we receive that cut off so we don't understand it. And so uh, this, this is an unnatural naturality argument, saying that this, this is strange. Uh, maybe we should look for a model that doesn't work. Can you work in the cooling, cut, the cooling cut off would be natural. I'll discuss this. This is about the this is lower energy, 10 GV. And you also have the ELAX criterion acceleration limit, which is a higher energy. And I think we. Does the limit of how much Yes, how far can you accelerate the electron given the age of the object? So you have some tools and then you move on. So this is not the scale which has any natural interpretation in my view. Does the hadronic model work better? So Ron already discussed it and how, how well it fits, provided that you take into account the secondary electron. But here too, you have the same problem, you have to impose a 40 EV cutoff. Now on the protons, this is also not natural. In fact, it's even worse here in some sense. So, however, I think it's an unusual object. And I, and we see it in a, it's an unusual task. So it's again a naturality argument. So, but I don't think that's the reason I'm raising this. But the reason I'm raising this is because I think there is a natural interpretation for this spectrum because of the schooling grid that this is mentioned. If the bubbles are have been living for a few mega years, you expect to find a cooling grid at around 10 GeV, which will give then give you a spectral break in the gamma rate of around 1 GeV. And you should naturally expect to find the uncooled spectrum, the speed for 0.5 that we saw from the A, should persist up to a GeV and should be broken into a spectrum of 2.1 after about this. And now this assumes that well, this is the cooling time for the starlight photon. So it assumes that you don't need to try the starlight photon or the back to it. But if you assume that, then this cooling break works well. And in addition, you get for free the upper break, which is not just the Klein Machina break that you get from starlight photon to accelerate. So you can interpret this naturally just by a, just by having a few mega year bubble scattered the starlight. So you don't need in this case you don't need to impose an 
So a natural algorithm argument would prefer this, but you can always argue that this is a natural object. An, un an unusual object. But you need a lot of starlight. And so, and one, of course, one addition is that this explains both the gamma rays and the haze and the insects simultaneously with the same population. So you don't need to go to different populations. So we see this, uh, you know, in the it was of uh, inverse Compton of the optical light from the direction of this, you should expect some uh, variation uh, as you go up in that. That's right. And we see some variation. I'll show you some variation. It's not very large. It will depend on the extinction that you see in starlight. But remember that you had an event there. Something dramatic happened in the galactic center and cleared a lot of dust. So um, it's not. I'm not sure the exclusion is so large as you go with that. Nevertheless, there should be some effect that we do see it from that. Uh, no, simply the distance effect. Oh, the distance effect, yes, that's right. Extinction will make it much worse, much more pronounced. Um, okay, so this, this so, so after this naturality argument, what's unnatural or seems unnatural to us is to get so much starlight at high latitudes. And you need a bit of a lot of starlight to get this. You need to be dominated by starlight in order to explain the spectrum. And this requires about 3 electron volts per centimeter cube volume integrated, which, which we were worried about, seemed a lot to us. At the time, this was more, a factor of three more than we found in the models. But since then, um, so first of all, I, I already mentioned that there's not much extinction in the bubbles. But these estimates of the stars have been revised recently. And there is now thought to be much more starlight than it used to be. And we used to think so. Yeah, I think this now is natural also in this sense. You don't need to make some, some crazy assumption about the starlight. So what method is And I think we wrote this earlier. So it's not very different from um, what we did in the Minotonic scenario. It's in the yeah. So it's a, uh, but also here to get this, we will give me the 5 to 20 microgauss. We need less than this model. We need a word of five months to have. So, uh, somebody's an insight, I don't know why. But, uh, so, uh, but I'll go back and model this in more detail. Uh, you don't need a very strong limit to be So, spectral variance, so this is the spectral integration over the entire bubble. Uh, but now I'll answer your question questions about variation. So this say uh, you can use templates and just make more templates, cut them, for example, and see the latitude dependence. This is what was done by Hooper and this again. And so what you see here is low latitude, higher latitude, even higher, and so it goes like this, as you increase the latitude. And you, what you see is that this uh, the lower part of changes, it becomes as you look, look at lower latitude, it's stronger, which is what you would expect. Uh, Come, you have more starlight in the center. But, but this is the second order effect. The zero order effect, the spectrum will not vary dramatically as you change latitude or, la or longitude. So the zero order of the first model are fairly symmetric, are, very, are fairly uniform. And you can explain this, by the way, this was the thing. Roland pointed out some options to explain it. One explanation is just having strong diffusion about 10 to 28 centimeters per second for triple reactors. And this is a, uh, this is not the crazy high value consistent with the magnetic field values that we're seeing. So diffusion for a few mega year bubble uh, of cosmic rays is sufficient to exotrify the spectrum to a rather huge make it homogeneous. Yes. Yeah, so it seems that uh, rather than increasing the intensity, you could also increase the flatness of the uh, spectrum unfold uh, with that view of spectrum, right? With that view. With that view. Yes. So. But the, um, uh, the spectrum of the unfolds uh, cosmic ray electrons has nothing to do with the uh, light, right? It's just how you accelerate them on. That's right. So I could if they if you not get the same spectrum as I could not understand why you uh, like uh, why you were saying because there are different fractions of starlight on total radiation field. That should uh, see in the uh, could see it in the uh, intensity of this. Also in the spectrum. Also in the spectrum. You change the, the sort, the, the, the radiation field. Of course, you can use Sheena for the special changes. But, but, also, but also, the, you have additional fields contributing at lower energies and making your lower cutoff smoother. 
So you have three radiation components, like the CD and the roughly speaking infrared and optical, all contributing a different amount to the tonight. This is the thing that I think we're seeing here. But I'm I'm not going to push this much because this doesn't show the systematics. In my view, the systematics here are, are much they're definitely worse than in, in one entry because here you have ten entries. Uh, I think they're too large to really discuss this in serious. And we can also now, since we have edges, and edges that uh, again say are very useful, we can just do look at the edge and look at the spectrum at the flux above the edge and below the edge, subtract them, and there we have a spectrum map there of the of the fluid bubbles right behind the edge with no need for tendons. So this is a much more robust measurement, much less systematic involved. Although the, although the statistics may be not so good because we're looking at a small range, but this is the trade-off we have. And whatever edge we use and whatever region we look at, we find these, uh, that there is this sudden drop in the flux and we can measure the spectrum fairly well. So what you're seeing here in the pink lines with the blue uncertain, systematic uncertainty is the insulated spectrum. What you're seeing in the cyan and yellow lines are the edge spectrum from the northern hemisphere in yellow and southern in cyan. Cyan is better. So look at that. And zero order is yes, we get the very similar spectrum at the edge as it probably is consistent with being roughly uniform. If you go to the second order, then you will notice that the spectra are softer at the edge than they are when you integrate. Not by much, but this is an interesting thing I would like to explain. Um, so the question is why um, why is the spectrum different when you look at the edge, near the edge, just behind the edge? Or over the entire volume, and the answer is why not? So, should we expect the edge spectrum to equal the total, if not integrated spectrum? And if so, consider injecting electrons with some power law, and then they cool off. And if there's enough diffusion, they fill the volume. So, you see, and so what you see is just the inverse topic in the emission of these, this electron spectrum. And now, what will happen in this spin slab, which I now, which we can see by looking at the edge, will it have the same spectrum? So if the diffusion has some energy dependence, then it should not be the same spectrum because you're going to lose all the so the diffusion always goes inward, it's not all the like under the density. So the you the energy is trying to the shock you have a high density shell. So the diffusion propagates inward and the higher energy electrons will escape quicker and you're not going to see them at the end, so of course you have a softer spectrum. How softer you can convince yourself that even with a broken power law, the effect is such that if the electrons are steepened by this factor delta, then the photon field will be uh, will be steepened by uh, factor delta just because it's a gamma square emission. It's probably the same. The same idea. Uh, so the question is, if we look at these kind of spectra, is it, will if we just tilt it by a, by some power law delta? Beta or delta will we again reproduce the that? In other words, is the edge spectrum steeper by a fixed power law with respect to the integrated spectrum? And the answer is yes. So here we just tilted it manually, tilted the edge spectrum, and then it matches, it matches pretty well the integrated spectrum. So this is consistent, consistent with the fusive uh, At high energies, we have poor statistics. So are the same, but at least at low energy. At low energy it works. Uh, and this is a typical tail you need, not so large. Uh, but this tells you then what kind of diffusion you're having. So this uh, this delta, this energy dependence on the diffusion is about half. So the diffusion function scales as the energy of the electron electron to the power of half. And uh, this is a equation like diffusion. Um, and it has to be fairly strong, um, stronger than the one you need to uh, homogenize the bubble, but not. But again, this value is still uh, consistent with the field that we get in the first bubble. Um, so that's one point. So we think that so the zero order is homogeneous, but you have some variations which are easily explained by the fusion. What's the microscopic explanation? Oh, exactly this. So this is the energy dependence of the diffusion function. It doesn't go as the energy to the one or three, the of the diffusion, but rather it's a higher energy dependence. And the microscopic model, which we can discuss later, I don't want to make 
take on the internet. So this is one point. The second thing we should worry about is why we get the same values of data in the most in different places, different, different regions, uh, which is telling us that we're having the, we're seeing the same spectrum at the edge. You actually don't need this argument. Just look at the edge and we see the same spectrum at high latitudes and some, an intermediate latitudes in the north and the south. And this is puzzling. Why would the shock? Why should the shock inject the same kind of electrons everywhere? This is a problem if the shock is weak. It's not a problem if the shock is strong. So strong shocks always inject the power, the same power law, to p equals n. That's equals two of electrons. So this is telling us that the shock cannot be very weak, otherwise you should see variation. So if you plug in the numbers, you see that the Mach number has to be more than five. So if you want this solution to work, the shock better be strong. It's a bit strange. So yeah, so if you agree with our views of the by the temperature jump and density jump, is, then, then the surface of the edges must be a forward shock. And if you agree with that for accelerating particles, it works. The spectrum it works, but only if the shock is strong and the diffusion is very strong. So, um, so if you have a uh, high maximum shock like 5, say at the top of the column uh, level, the near low latitude uh, is almost like a kind of parallel shock, you know, it's like very tilted. So the Mach number there would be, mm, I guess, pretty much less, right? So that's right. a different spectra in the But uh, so these variations, we cannot really go to low latitudes, we're only looking at the high and intermediate latitudes. And then the variation, so if you have a Mach number about, about five at the very top of the bubbles, then it will, it will be consistent even if you go to intermediate latitudes. The Mach number will be somewhat lower, but not so much as to contradict the thing. So this takes into account these you know, mild variations at high latitudes. If you could tell me what's the injected spectrum at very low latitudes, you could make a much stronger argument for the result. You're right, you simply cannot go to low latitudes. Too much of a mess in that way. I'll get to this in a few minutes, actually right now. Okay, so we think we understand the halo fairly well. Okay, it's not very far from the isothermal sphere distribution. Okay, in density, we even know what the density is. Okay, and we know the temperature, more or less. Okay, so we can take models, we can run simulations that people have done, uh, or model the injection energy and see how the uh, black wave looks like to check if it works. A big uh, uncertainty here, which was pointed out by several people, including Carter, I think, that is that um, the, um, the, day, the bubbles are sufficiently young that you don't necessarily have equilibrium between ions and electrons. And this is a big problem. So everything I said was based on emissions from electrons, almost everything I said. The ions will hold much more energy, so you have a very strong shock, very hot ion. You wouldn't know this. So this uh, I think answers the whole answer to your question. You should, there should there could be a large perspective here. Okay. So whenever we model such a young system in which the core of the end of the system uh, is less than the equilibrium time between electrons and ions, we should bear in mind that we actually not seeing the energy, we see just the the, the electron, the cherry on the pie. So um, I don't have time to uh, explain, walk through the simulations. I've just mentioned that several of them were performed, uh, both by Kartik and others, the Kartik and collaborators uh, sitting here, and other people. I, these, both of these simulations explain the Fermi bubble edges and the context of That's why it's fairly rugged. Um, and this simulation is nice because it when managed to squeeze in uh, the each one and the forward shop uh, simultaneously. Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss simulations. I just want to point out the toy model, which is simple, which is simple enough. And I think worth also mentioning to people because many people, all of us know the set of Taylor profile of a strong blast wave, but many of us never learned that the primo cop solution is actually simpler. So if you have an isothermal sphere and you're going up into a constant atmosphere, like say the Taylor of Neumann, you have a declining profile, then this is a very simple solution. It's just power loss. 
uh, of density and temperature. So in that way, the density in the, in the shell increases linearly. It increases linearly with radius and gravity. Um, so it's very easy to model these things. And thus, if you have this, if you see an edge, you need to project it to construct a new model, and that's just plug in these numbers. Of course, this is not a sphere, so it, it, these, these, this is an empty solution for a sphere. So you need to assume something. Uh, so here we just assume that the, the flow is the, goes uh, along rays emanating from the galactic center. Then you get this kind of, so these are, the yellow ones are clock size of contours, the blue ones are temperature contours. And so this is not as good as a simple simulation, so it's the first order guess you could have. And I also follow the road and try to push it as far as I can. So we were wondering, this is the result data, which might hide, if you think, hide the shell. So is there a, this kind of uh, contour that we expect from the flux seen here? Maybe. So you can quantify this and compute the project your model and see what kind of profile you expect. So this is the same diagram as before. Psi is the, the angular distance from the edge inward, and you expect the density, the flux to increase inward. They want to say something about the temperature, but I don't have the time for this. You should do the same for gamma rays and show that it was consistent with the three process in gamma rays, which we did. Uh, by the way, Sidon Tero is not be consistent with the with the three bubble. Um, and this, uh, this I'm just closing the loop and pointing out that this profile, which I showed earlier, matches this toy model fairly well. And then you can say something about the numbers. You can constrain the energy of the system. You constrain the so the density is consistent with the density you get are consistent with what the people think about the halo. And you get the Mach number and therefore the energy and age of the system. But everything is uncertain to this uh, ion to electron temperature ratio, which is simply hard to figure out. So the best we, we could do is use uh, Andy and Rogmund to resolve and also uh, Enrico will say something I think about the velocity of the flux as well. So with the same order of magnitude, uh, which is uh, roughly thousand kilometers per second. And if this, so we're not sure if these clouds reflect the flow, but if we take the same value, then we get that this rate we can figure out what this ratio is. And it's about 10. This will give you a Mach number of 10. Um, so we see that the, the temperature is rising just by a factor of two, but that, that's just because you're watching the left and you're seeing the electrons. The ions are much hotter. This will make the bubble more energetic than we thought, than I thought so far, and somewhat younger. I think this age is consistent with the ages we get from dynamics. And the energy is somewhat large, and it, it, this will be very hard to explain with the star dimension model, pushing it to our age energy. So I'm out of time. I was very optimistic. I was hoping to discuss visual shots because this was brought up already. So I wanted just to point out that we, in the recent years, we found new shocks in large halos, which tend to be in and drop through masses, but I don't have time for this one. Skip the images and just uh, so, so in summary, but if you want to explain this, just to summarize, um, there's a lot of evidence now, and we can, I think we can rule out large particles of the phase state. Uh, we, we have better ways now to deal with and analyze the data locally. We don't, we're not as reliant as we used to be on template subtraction. Uh, I think the edge condition, the, the jump condition of the bubble edges are pointing towards the forward shock. They definitely rule out the first shock. Uh, this asterisk is saying that this is my personal opinion. I think that this morphology is saying, telling us that each one is probably unrelated to the Tony bubble. We can do this with the uh, MWA and low far and other low frequency radio uh, data, which can be really, which we can really trace the bubble nicely. Uh, uh, this is the simplest model we get for the bubble based on the spectrum. Um, and this is called the dynamics uh, with the primacope like uh, explosion. Um, and the last point I want to make is that the bubbles are so extended on the sky that the community begin to trace how the quantum rays diffuse. So instead of a few words about what kind of diffusion it is and how strong it is, we can estimate how much energy is deposited into the electron and also I saw soon in the protons. And this is becoming a very useful plasma physics and quantum ray laboratory, simply because it's so extended on the sky. It's all soft. And the same. Thanks, Ashraf. Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh,
Thanks to both the uh, talks in the morning, uh, I learned a lot about coming over this. Uh, but my question is um, about the model you assumed and you showed about the middle. Uh, middle and pregnant, if I'm in the density, are a bit too large. How does it affect your calculations if they are lower, let's say, by number of It's lower and flatter, right? Sort of the minus two. Yes, lower and flat. But maybe the, the shape doesn't matter for you. You just what matters to you for you is the central density or shape matters. I don't know. Anyway. So this toy model and yeah. the eye on the shape in the R in two minus two. So if this is not the case, you need to more you know, doing its more sophisticated modeling and for I'm just a numerical simulation. And so the so this was all all this toy model was really only for and as a form of distribution. If we would change the, we, we measure the density inward of the bubbles. So if you would make the external density lower, you would infer a more a stronger shock, a higher Mach number, even without involving high marks. So the uh, so Mach number will go up and the energies will go up, which will become difficult. So I, I, I don't think, I think that the factor of 10 lower density top of the bubble would be very uh, difficult to understand in terms of energetics. So the number, you use, the number you use for the top of the bubble or, or the center of the gas? So we use the profile, but the, number, the specific number that I quoted, not here, but right here, here, is at 10 to your parsec at the very tip of oh, the bubble. Oh, no, level. this looks, no, if you go back a little bit, Uh, that one on top, halo. Oh, and um, that's ten minus three. Right, but this is oh, it's at scale. So this this what we got from the table. Uh, I think they have updated this. Uh, oh, the they have yeah. uh, lower, lower density and flatter profile. Yes, so this is ten to the minus three at ten kilopascals. The other one is ten to the minus four at ten kilopascals. Right, we're changing both this and this numbers that we're. Going well, to a different model, it's hard to explain. Okay. So, if you insist on the minus two, which we can then use for a chemical solution, it's always good to have the simplest model you can first. Then, uh, I think this is the number you get. You cannot change this much. By the way, the top of the bubbles is 10 kilo parsing if you want to explain uh, any projection. Uh, so, just a comment about uh, the uh, comparison that you made with Raman's uh, observations and views. I agree that you both of you like uh, get thousand kilometers or you know, a little less uh, per second, uh, kilometers per second for the formula of velocity. But I guess these two are different phases, right? So Raman say has like warm phase and yours have like uh, kind of hot phase. Right, and, and I'm not sure how. Show Sorry? And we will show a quick reason based on the entire time. But you're right. right. I, okay, so I think that we should be cautious about. Uh, I think I mentioned that this is an assumption, serious assumption going in, saying that the ground floor velocities are uh, anything to do with each other. This was already discussed also in the stock. These are different systems, and uh, there's a logical thing. Uh, when go, when uh, when going when doing this switching, this number is entirely dependent on this assumption. I think so. Uh, I think so. You can think of this as an unknown variable. This is another external assumption. And this is the best we can do right now. I think. So this energy, 1057, is that total energy, and how much is kinetic or other forms? This is total. So what, what, what is it mostly magnetic or kinetic or so I think the kinetic is 40% of this or so. So the factor of two is going to be It's not really different. So there's net thermal. Yeah, I, I just, just want to which it. So this is a high number. I agree. But as the as the point now this number, this factor of 10 is entirely dependent on this assumption that I'm not sure this is.
So, um, we see we see bubbles in other galaxies, um, but we do not. It would be very difficult to see these gamma ray features in another galaxy. It's been, I think there's one plane detection in another galaxy already. Yeah, that's so, a Special resolution is not bad. A special resolution is nothing to say, like, cannot say it is a bubble. The special resolution is low, and also the sensitivity is it's very marginally detected, and when it goes farther, it becomes impossible. So it would be very difficult to find this kind of bubble in another galaxy, but then, uh, therefore, I don't think we can say that it's an unusual uh, feature. Yeah, from the camera, I could not see the same thing. It's the same thing. Yes. yes, because so is the unusual because you don't see it in other yeah. systems? Yeah. So maybe the last question. Yeah, I just want to add a comment for the record because people have been talking about uh, velocities not being associated. Yes, it could be. But then you can also argue that every single case is independent. So why why do you throw out the result that does not match your model? It's a little bit hard to see. It could be. But the Hawkins phrase says that everything is coincident. Perhaps there is a correlation. That's what I'm saying. This is the only measurement for kinematics right now. No, I'm just to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm not the uh, like kind of gamma ray every single thing is a different thing. It's just everything like, the same thing happened by a different event. No, so, I, I, I'm just uh, uh, advocating the point that you know we should. Mm -hmm. Better understand that if these two phases are like of the from the same event, then we should better understand how this hot and cold phase have been like have got the same velocity. That's all. Uh, almost time for the next talk, so maybe we'll continue the, during lunch break. So let's thank Kishi again.